It's nice to see all of the uh, familiar faces. And uh, tonight, <clears throat> I am giving a pre-Shavuot Shi'ur. And I have to tell you in advance, when I originally sent out the topic for the Shi'ur, I thought I was going to go in one direction. And as I began thinking about it, I'm taking it in a slightly different direction. So if I don't necessarily stick to the description that you were given, so I hope that you will be understanding. And I also want to begin by thanking Simon for sending out the source sheet. So I hope that everyone has downloaded the source sheet. If you haven't, I will nevertheless refer to it, but I won't put it on the screen. So I encourage you, if you have it, to, uh, to have it before you, and I'll note which source we're referring to. So what I would like to begin with are the first few sources that I have on the page, which essentially describe the experience at Mount Sinai. And in particular, what I want to focus on is what I would call the <clears throat> theatrics of Sinai. And this is in our first reference in Shemot, Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. I mean, sorry, verse 16. It's the first verse on the page. It says that on the third day from when the people were supposed to get themselves ready for the revelation, there are kolot, there are sounds, which generally is translated as thunder, brakim, lightning. Anan kaved, a thick cloud on the mountain. And there's the sound of the shofar, which is very, very powerful. And all the people are trembling in the camp. So the image that we have over here is, like I would said, a very, very dramatic, what I would call prelude to God speaking to the Jewish people. And this dramatic prelude actually is extremely important. Okay, I see that uh, there was a request to put the source sheet in the chat room. So Simon, if you can do that. Now, the, the phrase which interests me is the fact that the people are trembling. Okay, for those of you who are familiar with Hebrew or certainly modern Hebrew, the word is vayecherad. Okay, in modern Hebrew, the word charedi is the term for somebody who's ultra-Orthodox. So already you get this idea that at least in theory, given what it says, someone who's ultra-Orthodox should be somebody who's trembling. Okay, we're not going to get into that discussion right now. But in any case, so that's the image. Even before God begins speaking, there's this sense of of tremendous, what I might call, uh, angst, which the people have. Now let's look at my second reference. Okay, this is after the Ten Commandments. We're told in chapter 20, verse 15, and by the way, some of you, if you're looking at Tanakh, there's a, there's a, a discrepancy in some Tanakhim. Some Tanakhim have this as verse 15. Some have it as verse 14. It says, Bechol Ha'am and all the people saw the sounds and the torches and the sound of the shofar and the mountain which is smoking. And the people see it and then they move. Now in the translation here, it says they trembled. Okay, so here you also have to always be, you know, see the Hebrew and compare it. I see that there are a bunch of people who are... Uh, in the waiting room. So maybe Simon, if you can admit them, or we can find some way of, I'm happy to do that. In any case, the, so what we have here is the, the word actually vayanu'u is not trembling, it's they're moving and they stand at a distance. Now, obviously whoever translated it, connected it with what came in chapter 19, and clearly, if the people are moving and moving backwards, you certainly have the sense that they're that they are they're somehow taken aback, if you want to use that language. 
And then the people come and they say to Moshe, and, and we will go with the assumption that all this is happening after the Ten Commandments. And they say to him, you speak to us and we will hear. But we don't want God to speak to us lest we die. And then Moshe's response to the people is, do not be afraid, in verse 17. Because in, for the purpose of testing you, God has come. And for the purpose of having his fear, which maybe we can translate awe, on your face, we might say today, in your face, right? So that you will not sin. So it's actually very interesting if you think about this in terms of this verse. Here's Moshe saying, don't be afraid, but the whole point of what's going on is that you should be afraid, okay? Which is very, very interesting. But in any case, the point which I want you to see over here is that beyond the Ten Commandments and hearing God speak, there was an experience which the people had. And that experience was something which was terrifying. The people are trembling. The people are so afraid they move back. They tell Moshe, stop it. We can't take it. Now, I just want to point out, I think we did this in one, one of the Parsha classes, that it was actually the people who asked to hear God speak to them. Because the original scenario was that God was going to speak to Moshe and the people would be kind of spectators, bystanders. But the people said, no, we want to have God directly speak to us. And then what happens is when, when God does that, the people are totally overwhelmed. Now let's just, by the way, I'll just note, and we'll maybe come back to this afterwards, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the mixture of these senses that you have in, in verse 15, where it says the people see the sounds, which is fascinating, right? It should say they hear the sounds, but no, they see the sounds. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, in my third reference in Deuteronomy, Moshe, 40 years later, is recounting to the new generation that's grown up in the desert what the experience at Sinai was like. And in chapter 5, verse 20, Moshe says to the people, when you heard the sound from the midst of the darkness and the mountain was burning with fire, the heads of the tribes and the elders came to me and they said, behold, God has shown us his glory, his greatness. We have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. And note it says, today we have seen that God speaks to, a, to people, to a person, and that person lives. So here it's very interesting. We see how God speaks. Clearly that connects with that, the people seeing the sounds. I'll come back to it in a moment. And then they say, but now why should we die? Because this fire will consume us, right? If we continue to hear the voice of God, okay, we will die. And then they go on in verse 23 and say, because who has ever heard the voice of the living God speak from the fire as we have and lived? And once again, they keep on saying, so you go near to God. And in verse 25, it says, and God heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me. And God said, I've heard the voice of the people. Whatever they've spoken to you, they have spoken well. And then in verse 26, would it be that their hearts would be with, will be with them to fear me, to observe, guard my commandments all of the days in order that it should be good to them and to their children forever. So the first thing which I just want to point out is that it's clear from certainly the second reference from Shmo chapter 20, from the third reference, right, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, 
that a major goal that God had in the revelation at Sinai was to actually instill fear in the people, to shake them up, to put the fear of God in them so that they would then, for all generations, observe the mitzvot. That fear of God should be in their face, on their face, the, an impact on them. The idea being that the experience of Sinai was meant to be transformative and to instill in the people that sense of fear of God. Let's look for a moment. I just made a switch in how I was going to do this, so you'll bear with me. To the fourth reference, I was actually not going to do it in order here, but now I changed my mind. I'm going to do reference number four. Reference number four is from Deuteronomy chapter 31, which describes essentially a, a ceremony that happens at the end of the sabbatical year during the festival of Sukkot. And if you look at the fourth reference, chapter 31, verse 10, Moshe commands the people <clears throat> saying the following, Miket Sheva Shanim, at the end of seven years, right, at the appointed time of the sabbatical year, which means in the aftermath of the sabbatical year, during the festival of Sukkot, when, in verse 11, when all the people come to the place which God has chosen, which is the temple, there should be a reading of the Torah in the ears of all of Israel. Gather all the people, men, women, children, the, the strangers in your gates. And here I have in bold print. So everyone will hear and everyone will learn. And they will fear the Lord their God and observe to do all the words of the Torah. And their children who don't know will also hear and learn to fear God all the days that you live on the land which you are now crossing as your inheritance. So this is this mitzvah is what is known as hakel, which has to do with <clears throat> kahal, a gathering. The gathering of the totality of the Jewish people on the Temple Mount, on Sukkot, immediately at the end of the Shemitah year, to have a public reading of the Torah. And according to rabbinic tradition, this public reading was actually done by the king, and there were selected sections from the book of Deuteronomy. And what is the purpose of this public reading? Well, what it says is that they should hear and they should learn, but to fear God, to observe the commandments. Clearly, the language here is echoing the language which was at Mount Sinai. And in fact, what seems to be is that this is meant to be in some fashion a kind of reenactment of Sinai. It's as if every seven years we're trying to reenact the experience of what happened at Sinai. To have this huge ceremony. By the way, I have to say that in Israel, I've actually been to a number of times where they did this at the Kotel, and they had the president of Israel, okay, who generally is not necessarily a, an observant or quote unquote orthodox Jew, certainly, who will actually do this Torah reading. And at least at the various occasions where I was there, there were anywhere between 20 and 50,000 people. And it was really a very, very powerful experience to see this public reading of the Torah, very moving. Um, I can't say that I experienced, right, this fear of God at the ceremony, but, but to use the vernacular, it certainly was awesome. 
So in any case, what are we doing? We're, we're trying to somehow keep that experience of Sinai alive. But again, I want you to see that the experience is somehow being encapsulated in this phrase of the awe, the fear of God. And that seems to be a major theme over here. Now, obviously, and that's why I was going to do this a little bit later with in my shear, but okay, now that I did it, the experience of Hakel in a lot of ways is radically different from the experience of Sinai. You don't have thunder and lightning. You might have a, you know, a band, right, which is playing really loud music, okay? There might even be some fireworks a little bit, but I doubt that that even comes near to what the experience was like at Sinai. So it isn't that same experience, but it's a kind of toned down version. Evidently, this idea of fear of God was seen as being central at the Sinai experience. And God says to Moshe that, in other words, I wish that this fear of God would somehow be engraved, embedded in the psyche of the Jewish people forever. So that in the end, they would observe the Torah and ultimately achieve the good. I want to digress for one moment to a major, how should I put it, key word that appears throughout these sections, which I read to you, the first three references from Sinai. And the key word throughout is Kol, the voice. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting, the fact that we, we speak about the voice and the sounds. And, you know, you could say, well, obviously we're going to speak about the, the sounds because presumably when it says there were sounds, right, in chapter 19 and lightning, so presumably the sounds are thunder. So what else are you going to say? Okay, or for that matter, <clears throat> when we talk about the sound of the shofar, makes a lot of sense. But when we get to Deuteronomy chapter 5, the third reference, it becomes very interesting if you look at chapter 5 in Deuteronomy, verse 25. It says, and God heard the sounds of your words. In that verse, it would seem to be that the, the word sound is superfluous. God heard what you had to say. So what does it mean, the sound of your word? And that comes up a few times. And God even says, I heard the sound of the words of the people, and they spoke well. So what I would like to suggest is that the sounds become key over here. And when we talk about the sounds, it's because there's a much deeper meaning to what's going on here. It's not that Oh, I heard, thir I, heard, I heard thunder. Okay, but when you hear that thunder, what association do you, meet, do you make? What impact does it have on you? When God hears the sound of the words of the people, it's not just what did they say, but how did they say it? What was their body language? And therefore, how do I understand 
what's going on inside of them. So maybe let me start with that. When God hears the sound of the voice of the people, well, I'm sorry, when God hears the voice of the words of the people, it isn't just, I heard what they said, but I could hear that how they were saying it. They got the point. I can hear the fear of God in their voice. I can hear what we would say today, the kavana which they have, which means it worked. They're not just saying it. They mean it. The purpose of the sounds here was meant to impress upon the people the magnitude of God. And here I don't speak tongue in cheek, the awesomeness of God and what it really means. And the question is, do they hear that? And now what I would like to say is, not only do they hear it, they see it. They got it. So it wasn't just, I heard something. I saw, I perceived, I understood what that sound was conveying. I got the message in a very, not only visceral way, but even in a deep intellectual way. Unfortunately, a few hours ago, for those of you who are living in Israel, so we experienced sounds in Israel, a siren. And the moment there was a siren, that immediately has a connotation. Well, why is there a siren? Well, there's only a siren because there are rockets being shot. Well, there were rockets that were shot at Jerusalem. And when you hear the sound of the siren, the immediate reaction is, I got to find shelter. There's a tremendous sense of dread. What happens if I don't make it to a shelter in time? So I just want to point out that the sounds, very often, what do we associate with those sounds? And what's the impact that those sounds have? And how much do we really understand those sounds? And what seems to be from all the verses that I brought, in fact, the people got it. They saw it. And God says, I can hear by their voice that they heard my voice. And would that that exist forever. And that would impact forever on how they would behave. Ultimately, for their good. But now I want to mention that we know, in fact, that that voice of the people was very short-lived. And again, I apologize, as I said, because I shifted gears in where the shear was going. So I didn't put this on my sheet. So you'll bear with me. At the golden calf, this is chapter 32, and you in Exodus chapter 32, verse 17 and 18, for those of you who have a Tanakh, you could look it up. If not, look it up afterwards. When Moses comes down the mountain, after he has heard <clears throat> the words of God, that the people have built a golden calf. All of a sudden, right, there's a sound in the camp. And in fact, the way it's described is a sound of evil, a bad sound. In fact, it's a, it's a, it's a shouting sound. And Joshua, as when Moshe sees him, Joshua says to Moshe, well, it's a sound of war. And Moshe goes, well, but it's not a sound of victory, and it's not a sound of defeat. It's just a loud sound. 
And it's only when Moshe finally comes, comes down the mountain that Moshe then sees what is that sound about. It's the revelry of people dancing around the golden calf. I'm not on any reference right now on the sheet, Debbie. I'm, 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 I'm giving you something off the sheet. Okay, this is the golden calf. Chapter 32, verse <clears throat> 17 and 18. But what do I want to show? The same people, right, who are described as the sound of their voice being pleasing to God. Later on, by the golden calf, the same word, the sound appears. But this time, it's a sound which is devastating, destructive, which embodies the abandonment of God. Which therefore means that somehow, all of the sounds at Mount Sinai, on a certain level, long term, perhaps, did not necessarily achieve their goal. It didn't create this dramatic transformation of their people so that from now on, they will see the light and they will do good all the time. No, they didn't. By the way, just to show you a kind of parallel, I think I mentioned this in the Parsha series, and that's reference five. So for those of you who have the sheets, I'm coming back to my sheets. In the seventh plague, the plague of hail. So everybody's familiar with, you know, how there's hail which comes down and there's fire in the midst of the hail. But what people tend to also not, not you know, pay attention to is if you look at chapter 9 in Exodus, verse 23. It says that Moshe set forth his hand and then God brought sounds, kolot, barad, and hail, and fire in the midst of the hail. What were those sounds? Well, you could say the sounds, as I often say, was the hail that was coming down, right, with such power, with such force right, like artillery shells, boom, boom, boom. But, but it seems the sounds actually came before the hell. Now, note the fact that Pharaoh, in the aftermath of the plague, uh, calls Moshe, summons Moshe. And if you look in reference 5, verse 28, Pharaoh says to Moshe, pray to God, enough of the sounds. And he doesn't just say sounds, kolot Elohim, the sounds of God and the hell. But what you see is what drives Pharaoh crazy are the sounds. And then when Moshe in the next verse says, and I'll get rid of the sounds so that you'll know that there's, that God is the ruler of the earth. But look at verse 30. Moshe says to Pharaoh, but you and your servants, I know that you still do not fear God. So here I just want to show you, again, I'm connecting it with Sinai. It wasn't just the hail. It was the sounds of God in this plague that was supposed to bring Pharaoh to fear of God. And now I'm going to go back to a verse that I skipped because I was so enthusiastic, I should have actually shown it to you earlier. Right? When Moshe initially comes to Pharaoh, verse 27, Pharaoh says to Moshe, the first time he says this, hapam, I have sinned this time. I made a mistake. God is righteous. I and my people are evil. Which means that on a certain level, if the sounds were supposed to instill in Pharaoh this fear of God, at face value, it worked. First time that Pharaoh says, I've sinned. I and my people are wicked. 
But Moshe says to Pharaoh in verse 30, I know that you and your people really don't fear God. Yes, you said this. But now to take what I said a few moments ago, but I can hear your voice. I can hear your sound beyond the words. And the way that you're saying it, you're not serious. You really don't fear God. And then we see at the end in verse 34, as soon as the rain and the hail and the sounds cease, Pharaoh continues to sin, which means that Moshe was right. So what am I trying to show you? That here is God who is talking and communicating, right? And through these sounds, sounds that are overwhelming. And they have an impact. But it seems to be both by the Jewish people after Sinai and by Pharaoh in the aftermath of the hail, the sounds had a very, very limited impact in terms of producing this fear of God, a fear of God that would lead to observance of the word of God. In the case of the Jewish people, to observe the Ten Commandments. In the case of Pharaoh, to let the people go, as he had said he would do. Now let's go on to one more reference connected with the idea of sounds. And that is... Wait a second. Ah, yes. Hold it. I'm missing my uh, number six. Number six is a story which everyone is familiar with. Elijah the prophet. And everybody, I'm sure, is familiar with the story of where Elijah the prophet gathers the prophets of Baal and there's a showdown. And it's very, very dramatic. And fire comes down from heaven and consumes Elijah's sacrifices. And Elijah even says to the people, this is your moment of truth. Choose whether you worship the Baal or whether you worship God. And everybody goes, Hashem Elohim, God is king. God is great, right? But that and that is very short-lived. And then it seems that Elijah is actually a fugitive who's running away from King Ahab who wants to kill him. And he's running away and he eventually ends up at Mount Chorev. For those of you who don't know, Chorev, which is Sinai. And you could check this out in Exodus, the beginning of chapter three. In fact, there are references here that hint to that passage, Moshe and the burning bush. And then he comes into a cave and then the word of God appears to him and he says, what are you doing here, Eliyahu? This is Kings 1, chapter 19, verse 9. And then Elijah says, I have now, I have been moved by the zeal of God, right? I have avenged, right? been jealous for God because the Jewish people have abandoned <clears throat> the covenant. They have destroyed your altars. They have killed your prophets. And I alone, right, I'm the only one who's left. And now they want to kill me. And then God says to him, why don't you go out, <clears throat> go outside Stand by the mountain. And then we have this fascinating passage. God passes by. And there is a mighty wind that can destroy mountains, tear apart huge slabs of rock. But God is not in the wind. And then there is 
an earthquake. And God is not in the earthquake. And then after the earthquake, there is fire, right? God is not in the, now by the way, right? All of these things you could also see as you know, having been at Sinai, we certainly have the fire. You might see the, the earthquake, you know, with the mountain that was trembling. And it wouldn't be so far-fetched that there may have been a wind. Certainly there was a wind at the, at the Red Sea, at the splitting of the Red Sea, which the people experienced. And all of a sudden there is a silent, thin sound. And when Eliyahu hears it, he covers his face with his cloak. And essentially, God is in that silent, slight sound. And then once again, God asks him, what are you doing here? And he says, I am defending the glory of God. And here I am. I'm the last of the Mohicans. And like, presumably, save me. And essentially what happens is in the aftermath, God says, you know what, Elio, you finished your job. Okay, do X, Y, and Z, and then I'm taking you. This section I think is fascinating because it says that maybe ultimately the presence of God is to be found in that soft, silent voice rather than in that very powerful voice, that very powerful sound. And maybe God is trying to teach a lesson to Eliyahu that maybe you're too caught up with dramatic theatrics and you also are caught up with your zealotry. Maybe you have to be able to tone it down a little bit. And maybe if you want to make an impact on the Jewish people, You have to find a different way of speaking to them, a different voice. But now I want to take this in another direction for us. If the purpose of the sounds at Sinai was to instill in the people that fear of God to observe the mitzvot, it doesn't seem that it worked certainly in the aftermath of Sinai. So then what's the alternative? So what I would like to examine for the rest of the year, maybe there's a different type of sound that can bring us to a fear of God. Perhaps what we might call our inner voice, something which is not shouting at us, but speaks to us, perhaps in silence. So I'd like to begin with reference number eight. Oh, that's interesting. I guess I guess I skipped my numbering. Okay. I must have forgotten seven. Okay, in any case, doesn't matter. Reference eight, which is Rambam. Maimonides in the Mishnah Torah, in the section which outlines the fundamental principles of the Torah, says there's a mitzvah of loving God and fearing God. And he brings two verses. And now let's look at Halakha Bet. This is chapter 2, Hilchot Yisodea Torah, Halakha Bet. And I'll read the English. But how may one discover the way to love and fear God? When a person will, I'm trying to, you know, paraphrase it a little. When a person will reflect concerning God's works, reflect upon, I would say, God's works, and God's great and wonderful creatures, and will behold through God's works and God's creatures, God's wonderful, matchless, infinite wisdom, He will spontaneously be filled with love, praise, exaltation, and become possessed of a great longing to know the great name, even as David says, right in Psalms, 
My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, which means according to Maimonides, and this is Maimonides, how does one come to a love of God? By contemplating nature, nature. By seeing the wonders of nature, one comes to then see the what the Rambam calls infinite wisdom of God. And when you see that, you're drawn to it. You want to come near to it. You want to be able to somehow understand it, to embrace it. But then Rambam says, and, and this is my bold print, and when he will think of all these matters, he will then be taken aback in a moment and stricken with awe and realize that he is an infinitesimal creature, humble and dark, standing with an insignificant and slight knowledge in the presence of the all-wise. As David also said, for when I see your heavens, the wonderful works of your fingers, what is man that you remember him? Which means, what are we? We're nothing. So it's fascinating that Rambam says when people go out in nature and really look at it, contemplate it, it gives you the sense of tremendous, the awesomeness of it. But that awesome, awesomeness initially attracts you. You want to embrace it. You want to become part of it. And according to Rambam, it's not just the nature. It's ultimately the God who created that. Because you imagine what a God, what unbelievable wisdom. But then when you come to that point, then Rambam says the next step is you step back. Because then all of a sudden you begin to realize how small you are. It's an extremely humbling experience. It's as if, and how could I even begin to understand it? I want to embrace it, but how can I even begin to imagine that I can embrace it? Who am I? I am nothing. That's what Rambram presents in the Mishnah Torah. So that how does one come to fear of God? According to Rambam, you go out in nature. And here I'm just going to throw in something, since sometimes we would do this on Pardes Tiulim. Okay, we're on a Pardes Tiul. We're out in some unbelievable spot. Now let's all split up in silence. Everybody just look, meditate, take it in. That's what Rambam says. He would have loved Pardes Tiulim. And then, but it's not just take it in and embrace it. But maybe it also becomes a very humbling experience. And then you begin realizing who you really are. You're a speck in this huge universe. Now I want to go to Nachmanides. And Nachmanides takes it in a different place, which I'm sure Rambam would agree with as well. This is Nachmanides' introduction to the Torah. Nachmanides, the classic medieval commentary on the Torah. And I want to read it because I think if you, ha if you haven't seen it, it's, it's worth seeing. In the name of the great God and the fearful, I will begin to write novel interpretations in the explanation of the Torah with terror, with fear, with trembling, with sweat, and with dread, praying and confessing with a contrite heart and broken spirit, asking forgiveness, seeking pardon and atonement, with bowing, with kneeling, with prostration, until all of the vertebrae of the spine seem to be loosened. And my soul knows with absolute certainty 
that the egg of an ant is not as small in comparison to the outermost sphere as my little wisdom and brief knowledge are compared to the secrets of the Torah that are hidden in her house, concealed in her room. For every precious thing and every wonder, every profound mystery and all glorious wisdom are stored up with her, sealed in her treasure by a hint, by a word in writing and in speaking. Just as the prophet who was adorned with royal garments and a crown, by the way, this is a reference to King David because he's gonna quote a, vote, a verse from Psalms. The anointed one of the God of Jacob, the author of the sweetest of songs, King David said in Psalms, I have seen an end to every purpose, but your commandments are exceedingly broad. Furthermore is written, your testimonies are wondrous, therefore my soul has guarded them. But what shall I do? Since my soul craves for Torah, and she is in my heart as a consuming, burning fire, in my kidneys restrained to go forth in the footsteps of the former ones, the lines of the group, the exalted of the, of the generations, the men of might, to enter with them in the thickness of the beam to write as they did explanations and midrashic commentaries. Okay, so I think people got the point and you can read the rest afterwards. But I wanna actually begin with the second part, which I don't have in bold print. This is the Rambam who's beginning to write a commentary, I mean, for us, right? This is the introduction to his comment to, to the Torah. What's motivating him when he's writing this commentary? So I wanna start with the second part. What's motivating? My soul craves for Torah. It's something that I'm dying to learn. It's something which is attractive to me. It's something which has tremendous wisdom, right? And presumably, right, you would be saying for anybody who's begun to learn Torah according. So you begin seeing the wisdom of the Torah and it's something which really, you know, gets you excited. I would hope that's what's going on with everybody here, that you're, you're, you're in this year because you want to learn Torah. You have this tremendous desire. So that's what, and this is similar to what Rambam said when you look at nature. I see it and it's, it's attractive. It pulls me. I want to embrace it. It's, it's coming out of love. But now I want to come to how the Rambam begins. But now he says, after, okay, I'm in love with Torah, which is why I'm doing this. But now, all of a sudden, I have trepidation. I'm sweating. Why am I sweating? Because then all of a sudden, I pull back and say, isn't it hubris for me to write a commentary on the Torah? Who am I? What do I know? How do I even begin to get a handle on what's going on? And what if I make a mistake? And what if I draw all kinds of conclusions from that mistake? So that what I'm doing is going to become a total desecration. And what the Ramban is articulating is this tension between the love and the fear. Ultimately, he wrote the commentary. And ultimately, he studies Torah because he's in love with Torah. But at the same moment, at every step, he also has that sense of awe, of trepidation, that profound sense of humility. So that here are two ways of coming to this fear of God through a silent voice, contemplating nature, studying Torah, being drawn to two different manifestations of God, of God's voice, but a different kind of voice, not thunder, but a silent voice, but a voice which is drawing me and at the same time is intimidating. I just want to point out now, since we are talking about Shavuot, 
and of people who have the custom of staying up all night and of theoretically, right, trying to reenact even or be do what's called a tikkun, in fact, of what happened at Mount Sinai by staying up all night. But I would th- posit this right now. The purpose of staying up all night and studying Torah should be a transformative experience. As a result of that experience, Maybe through the learning, I should have that sense of awe. And in fact, I would even add, it shouldn't just be on Shavuot. It should be at any time. I'll never forget that very often I would hear people in Pardes say, oh, learning Torah is fun. That would be the last thing which I would say about learning Torah. Torah is not about fun. Torah is something that should be really awe-inspiring. It should be a humbling experience. It's something which should be engaging, but the purpose of the engagement should be to have me put in perspective who I am and what my place in the world is. And it shouldn't be coming about because you necessarily have a teacher who's yelling and shouting, which I get very enthusiastic and I tend to sometimes speak loudly, but it's not because I wanna get people intimidated. But the point is, it should be the words, the sound, the voice of the words that blow people away, that create a profound sense of humility. And that leads me into the next reference, number 10. There's a verse from Proverbs which says, on the heel of humility is fear of Hashem, wealth, honor, and life. And since Rashi has two interpretations of this verse, and it just shows you how, you know, even for people who know the Hebrew, it's not clear. So if you look at Rashi, Rashi says, fear of Hashem comes as a result of humility. Alternatively, humility is central and fear is subordinate, which is interesting. Is it that humility leads to fear of God? Or is it that fear of God leads to humility? And Rashi brings up both interpretations. I'll skip for one second to reference number 11, or actually where it says in reference 11, this is from Masechet Sota, Tractate Sota, chapter 9, Mishnah 15. It says, or actually, I'm sorry. Wait a second. I missed something here. Well, it says when Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi died, humility and fear of sin ceased to exist. So you have a Mishnah that explicitly, based on presumably this verse in Mishle, connects humility and fear of sin. But right now we're going to go with the interpretation that humility is a critical ingredient for fear of sin. And here I brought the Malbim. The Malbim is a famous commentary on Tanakh. He lived in the 1800s, originally from the Ukraine, and then he became rabbi in Romania and Bucharest. And he wrote a commentary, which is a modern commentary. And he's very, very careful about language. And one of the big things in the Malbim is that when you have synonyms, he says synonyms where you have two words that ostensibly are saying the same thing, his big thing is they're not saying the same thing. Even though it seems they're saying the same thing, but each one has a nuance to it. And therefore he's very careful in understanding every time that you have two words that seem to be synonyms, 
But what's really the nuance? What's unique about each one? And why is that important? Just to give you an example, although I'm not going to get into his explanation, we have two expressions that come up a lot in Tanakh. La'olam, which means forever. And then we have Lador Vador, from generation to generation. Now, presumably, you would say, well, forever is the same as for all generations. But he goes into a whole thing about how, no, on one level, yes, they share something in common, but on another level, there's something very, very different about them. In any case, so here he gets into an explanation, not about synonyms, but about humility and fear of God. So look at what he says. Humility stems from perceiving the greatness of the creator, his great power and the reality that he created to the point where he realizes that he is negligible compared to even a fraction of creation. Even if one were to attain in this world royalty, wisdom, courage, and all other sublime qualities, he should know that he is like a small ant in comparison to the great king who stands over him. I just want you to see how what he's done in this excellent commentary is in a sense to conflate what we saw in Rambam and Ramban. But he's essentially taking what the two of them said in two different contexts and saying that <clears throat> when you see the greatness of God, right, that creates within you a profound sense of humility. And then he says, and this awareness inevitably brings fear of God. That one fears doing anything contrary to his will. As the Ramah wrote, I place God always opposite me. So he says that one who has humility then has fear of God. And how does that fear express itself? That a person will not do something contrary to the will of God. And he quotes the Ramah. Now, for those of you, which is my next reference, and please excuse me for going a few minutes over, okay? But for the people in my Parsha share, you already know that I take that liberty to go a few minutes over. The Ramaz Rav Moshe Isilis, who <clears throat> is considered to be the chief Ashkenazi Halach authority, lived in the 1500s in Krakow in Poland, and in the in his opening statement in the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, he says the following. And again, this is a quote from Psalms. I always place God before me. That's the quote from Psalms. This is a fundamental principle of the Torah and a sublime quality of the righteous who walk before God. The way one sits, moves, engages in his various activities when alone in his home is not comparable to the way he behaves when he's in the presence of a great king. The way he speaks and opens his mouth widely when he is together with his family members and friends is not comparable to his speech in the presence of the king. How much more so if one sets to his heart that the great king, the holy one, blessed be he, whose glory fills the earth, stands upon him, sees all of his one's actions. And he quotes this verse from Jeremiah, which I'll just skip for saving time. There will immediately come to him the fear and the humility of the dread of Hashem and the constant shame before him. Constantly he will not be Consequently, he will not be embarrassed when people ridicule him for serving God, may he be blessed. Even when one is walking alone or lying in bed, he should have the awareness before whom he is sleeping. As soon as one wakes up, he should get up diligently to serve his creator, may he be blessed and elevated. Which means, according to the Ramah, he starts out the Shulchan Aruch by saying, God should always be in your face, opposite you. How much does a person feel that no matter where they are, 
God is there watching them. And he gives the analogy, right? Look at how people behave when they're in the privacy of their home or when they're in, quote unquote, their comfort zone with family and friends. And how do they behave when all of a sudden they're in the presence of very important people? And I'm sure everybody here can think of it, somebody who's very important to them. And how would you talk? How would you act? And I don't think there's anybody here who would say, well, I don't act any differently in the privacy of my home when if, for example, I'd be in the presence of the president of the United States or if maybe the chief rabbi, if that says anything to you, okay? Now, the question is, why do you behave differently when you're in the presence of somebody who's really, and in some cases, it might be somebody that you quote unquote idolize. So it's interesting. It's not because you're necessarily afraid they're going to punish you if you do something wrong, right? They're going to throw you in jail. They're going to hit you. They'll give you lashes. Once upon a time, that was true. Today, I don't think that's true. But what the Ramah says, it's, it's because you're embarrassed. It's like, this person is so great. Like, would I do something really trivial, maybe a little bit obnoxious in the presence? I feel embarrassed. And so this is the sense, and this is what I want to bring up, that if you're in the presence of some great being, it creates a profound sense of humility, a sense of humility, which therefore creates also a certain sense of embarrassment. But what that embarrassment does is to then make you very careful about how you talk, how you act. And I would say not only very careful, but also to act in a much more refined level. And yes, as I see in a comment, if that's how people act in the presence of people, how much more so the Ramah says, if you really have that sense, you are in the presence of God. And perhaps this is something which I think is very, very difficult for everyone. How does one actually have that sense that I am in the presence of God, which then creates that profound sense of awe to the point where in the end, it shapes how I behave. And as I mentioned, Rambam says, well, if you want to get there, contemplate nature. And the more that you contemplate it, the more that creates that inner voice, that sense of the divine. And Ramban, just based on his introduction, would say, learn Torah. And the more you learn Torah and begin to realize the tremendous depth and breadth, that can do it for you. And if you look at number 11, Tractate Avot, there's a third way. Not that I want this to necessarily be the you know, preferred way, but Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who was known to be somebody who was tremendously humble, as I mentioned earlier in the second reference in 11, he said, contemplate upon three things and you'll never come to sin. Know what is above you, an eye that sees, an ear that hears. All of your actions are written in a book. Now, I think today people could really appreciate this. I mean, in certain contexts, which are actually not to, you know, not to, how should I put this? Uh, <clears throat> admirable. You know, imagine you're in a room where you have a camera, a hidden camera, that's actually videoing, video, videoing everything that's going on. Or you're in a room which is bugged, where you have a microphone, where you hear everything that's going on. How careful would you be about what you say, about what you do? Okay, now obviously the situations where that comes up, are situations which are invasions of my privacy, which right, which we would see as being abhorrent, and they are. But on the other hand, if you really believe in God and believe God is everywhere, so 
you have a video, you have a mic, which is on 24 seven. Okay, and not only is it on, but everything is then being transcribed in a book so that when you come upstairs, right, I have these images, right? When I come upstairs, the first thing that I'm gonna do is, here, take a seat. Now you'll see the video, this is your life. But you're seeing everything in all the different aspects. And then, you know, oh, you start cringing, ah, oh, okay? But we don't think in those terms. But maybe, and, and my next reference, and I'm not gonna read it, it's from the Path of the Just, the Silat Yesharim, written by Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, a major ethical work, which essentially is outlining the path to perfecting your attributes, your qualities. And the question is, what is it that prevents us from really coming to this idea of humility? And essentially what he says is that what stops us is a lot of times because we have, you know, we have luxury, we have, you know, everything is going well for us. We become complacent, okay? And, and we become so caught up with ourselves, it's very, very hard to have a sense of humility. And the second thing which he says, which I also want to bring up, is when we also think we know it all. And he says, the people who think they know it all are the biggest fools in the world. He says, because somebody who's really wise realizes how much they don't know. The deeper a person is, the more they begin to realize how, how they don't really understand. I see that somebody says, well, you can't live that way. But, and it's true, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. But on the other hand, what I would say is, but maybe it's something to aspire to on whatever level. And the reason for that is because if we don't have that sense of fear of God, of that eye that's watching us, of that ear that's hearing us, then how much do we become complacent in our actions? How much do we stagnate? How much do we then also rationalize and justify all kinds of things that we do and not grow? And if ultimately as human beings, we're meant to grow and to develop, the only way to do that is to be able to maintain that sense of humility. So if I will perhaps summarize Humility is a key factor to this fear of God. And if it's going to happen, it's not going to happen necessarily because people have thunder and lightning and booming voices, but because people are somehow able to open up to an inner voice, an inner voice that opens itself up to contemplating creation, to contemplating words of Torah, to contemplating where you come from, where you're going to, to have a sense of perhaps there's something much greater than you that exists that you are accountable to. And maybe it's that sense which can then get us to always develop and move forward and at least aspire to perfecting ourselves. And I just want to end with my last reference. And I'm sorry that I couldn't do this more, but at least it's connected with the topic. We spoke about Sinai, but then we also have another mountain, which is Har HaMoriah. And at least in the Chumash, the significance of Mount Moriah is the famous story, chapter 22 in Breshit, of the binding of Isaac. And perhaps for our topic tonight, the key element which comes up at the end of the Akedah is that an angel appears to Abraham and says to him, and this is in my last reference, the very last reference, 
don't lift up your hands against the boy. Don't do anything to him because now I know you fear God. You haven't withheld your son from me. And I want to just connect this with whatever I've been speaking about. A few chapters earlier, when God said to Abraham, I'm about to destroy stone. In chapter 18, and I even have it on this last source. And Abraham argues with God. Well, maybe there are 50 righteous people, 45, 40, 30. Here is Abraham arguing and fighting. And yet at certain points, and I have it in bold print, Abraham says, but who am I to be arguing with God? I am dust and ashes. It's that profound sense of humility, which comes in the midst of that very eloquent back and forth that ultimately leads to Abraham at the Akedah, who's silent. In the text, we don't find him saying a word, arguing. The only thing which he says is a short conversation with Yitzchak where he says, God will decide who will be the burnt offering, my son. And perhaps it's that silent sound which then leads him to doing what God wants him to do, to on the one hand bring up Isaac, but at the same time, to then refrain from doing the Akedah. And for that reason, he is called someone who fears God. But that was a process. It began in chapter 12, and when God said the first time, Lech Lecha, it reached its climax in chapter 22. And perhaps that becomes also a model People don't transform overnight. They need to go through a process. And that process can happen over a very long period of time. And so maybe <clears throat> it's not that I'm expecting, right? Everyone, anyone to in any way come to this model, but each of us in our way should see this as something to aspire to and to see how we can bring more of that sense of fear of God, which is coming from that still silent voice in order to become the best people we can. Chag Sameach to everyone. And I look forward to, uh, I think it'll be after the summer, to continuing with those people who I see who have been with me for live with Rab Meir to uh, to continue live with Rab Meir after the summer. Chag Sameach, and uh, I'll just share also with you for uh, since I feel these are my friends here. The uh, uh, a week and a half ago, my daughter gave birth to a baby boy, and so this is something which has very brought a lot of joy to my life and. Uh, and is, uh, <clears throat> and is a way of moving forward. So we should be able to always share with each other very, very good news. Chag Sameach. Okay, and you'll excuse me. On, if, if there are people who want to have comments, which daughter, Ayala. So if people want to stay for a few minutes, comments, uh, questions, so for a few minutes, uh, I, wel I welcome any comments, questions. And feel free to unmute yourself. You also don't have to feel obligated to say anything. So if people don't want to, so feel free to do that too. And uh, we'll just say Chag Sameach. Oh, I need to unmute you? Okay, I don't, I, how do I do this? Simon, can you help me out here to try to unmute people? You did it. Okay. Okay, Debbie. So I see you have the floor. Okay. I think it's I think it's hard I to be. There are two Debbies here. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. I was looking at Debbie Denenberg. So.
Let that be shoe back it. I'll just say that when I delivered twins at, at NYU hospital, one of the safest hospitals in the world, the head of maternal nursing of said maternal to me about the bris, get a moil. Do not let a doctor do it. I know you'll have a moil, but I just wanted to say mazel tov. And I think that's a funny. We story. had a moil and he's like very I'm experienced. Sure. Thank I'm God. sure. Wait, and that's what they say. Way more. Anyway, Rabbi, mazel tov. Rabbi, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Rabbi. Deb Schubach. Okay. Yeah, I think being humble is one of the most difficult things for people. Absolutely. To get the ego out of the way. It's very tough. I agree with you 100%. And that's why I think it's, uh, and I would even add, it's especially difficult in today's reality. Because people have so many things that can make them feel empowered. And not only that, but the buzzword everywhere you go is empowerment. And to be speak to speak frankly, <clears throat> that's why I have a problem with a lot of the frameworks that uh, I sometimes operate in. That maybe in, instead of speaking so much about empowerment, we should also speak about you know a sense of humility. And maybe if we had more of a sense of humility, then maybe that would actually be in the long run, okay, a much more uh, <clears throat> I would say powerful tool for people to move forward. I agree. It's a lifelong, lifelong journey. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be back, I have to say, um, and to hear you, and also um, a mazel tov on, on the birth, the renewal. That's Thank really you. pretty marvelous. Um, so let me ask you this. So we're always holding up um, Moshe Rabbeinu as the most anav person ever. And at the... Uh, um, when at the burning bush, when he he's pushing God away five times, he gives pronouncements. He says, no, 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 no. And you see God's getting mad at him finally says to him, all right, Aaron, and your brother will go with you and you will. And it's all about speaking. And um, Moshe is talking about lo ish dvarim anohi, but I'm not a man of words. And I see the tension throughout Moses's life. Speaking, not speaking, speaking, not speaking, ending up, of course, with 34 chapters in Devarim, where Moses is prolix. He's, he's speaking and speaking. And yet at the transformative place, when he went to Midian and he was Achar Hamidbar, um, he was um, Mitbodeid and Mitpalel. So the tremendous sense is aloneness, self-reflection, and from that moment, is that when, because he was listening so closely to Rambam's idea of nature, he was in the, he was alone in the Achar Hamidbar, nothing else except scarabs and, and vegetation that was sparse. Is that where he could actually do the, what do we call it, the, the better word than transformation, the complete reversal of saying to God, not me, not me, not me, and running away and seeing the, the lamb and seeing the bush and then saying, okay, it has to be me. Is that a reversal of his humility or is that just his humility pushing him closer to God? I, I mean, I think it's an excellent question, but I, I, I would say I would say, first of all, you know, that's a great example of uh, also someone who went through the tremendous uh, process. In other words, he starts out by, <clears throat> by refusing to take on his role, by saying he's somebody who's not a, a man of words. He ends up being the one who left the greatest legacy of words to the Jewish people, okay? And he's somebody who ultimately takes on his role, okay, embraces it, okay, to the end. So yeah. in, that, in that sense, I think Moshe becomes, again, a model similar to Abraham of somebody who had to go through a certain process. The, the one thing which I would say is that uh, inherently Moshe has that humility, but sometimes when you take humility to its extreme, then that becomes hubris also. Wow, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so think about it. When you have people who you know, keep on saying, I'm not capable of doing this, and keep on playing the old time, very often the victim card. So then mm -hmm. it's essentially to draw attention to themselves and to be able to get people to, you know, and to really become the focus of people's attention. And it becomes a way of getting out of doing something. So there's a balance. 
And then so in Moshe's, and, and essentially what God says to Moshe, which was in that case, is I'll be with you, right? In other words, and I will empower you. And then you have to, so it's like, you can't, you know, it's what, the way that I began was, you know, like with Rambam or even with Ramban, right? Well, here are the words of Torah or here is nature. I want to embrace it because I feel that it's very, very empowering. And then as I go to embrace it and it's empowering, I then step back and say, but well, wait a second, you know, who am I to be doing this? And with Moshe, it was a kind of process that was working in the other direction. He was starting with like, I am nothing, I am nothing. And he needed to then be, you know, to come to a point where he was then empowering himself and essentially saying that by connecting himself to God, by allowing himself to connect to God, that in the end, that's what would enable him to overcome that. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Allison. So we're, we're told that we're supposed to imitate God in things like, you know, like um, Hashem, Hashem, Kelrach, and Vahan, and, and it, all of those things. I mean, for sure, God has nothing to be humble about. And yet that's the mo that's the thing that we need to be, that's that should be our biggest trait. And it, it's, I just find it interesting that it's not mentioned. I mean, it can't be mentioned there, but it isn't mentioned in other ways all the time. Well, okay, so so I actually, I'm just trying to look and see if I included it here. No, I, I took it out at the end because I should have left it. There was there was one reference which which appears in Midrashim that I. Uh, that says, why did God actually give the Torah on Mount Sinai? Because that was an expression of God's humility. And they say, there are so many huge okay. mountains in the world. So why didn't God give the Torah from Mount Everest? Why from Sinai? And, and like Sinai is not impressive as a way of saying that. This is, you know, saying that in the midst, right, of that majesty is humility. And that I think also becomes the message, you know, in that whole encounter between God and Eliyahu. Okay, here I am. I'm showing you, right, that I can have this wind, I can have this earthquake, I have this fire. But ultimately, where is my presence to be found? In that soft, silent voice. So I think that those are just, you know, those are two examples of, of where God's humility comes across. And, but I think you can see that in, many other examples also even that encounter with you know even in the in the plague of hell where here is god who's prepared to actually forego right and and i think i mentioned this actually one time in the parsha god says in the beginning of the in that plague chapter nine in shemot god says i'm bringing this plague so you will know that there is none like me so like, you know, what's so unique about God that came across in the plague of, you know, hell. And so, so one way of taking it is what, what's so unique about God is the fact that <clears throat> here there was hell that never was and never will be. Or here there is hell where we have fire in the midst of the hell. We have two completely opposite things that are somehow coexisting. So the answer, though, which I give is that what, what was so great about God was God is giving Pharaoh an opportunity to have his cake and eat it, too. Mm. What does that mean? God says to Pharaoh, you know what? I'm about to bring this plague. And what's going to happen in this plague is that there are going to be people who are going to die. But what I'm doing is telling you in advance, send out a directive to your people. Tell them to go inside the house. And that way they won't die. And what he says to Pharaoh is, you know what? You can avoid my plague and still not let the Jewish people go. Because if all you do is send your people inside, nobody's going to die. And so what is God doing there, which makes God so unique? God is showing that even to God's enemies, quote unquote, the tremendous compassion which God has. God is in effect saying to Pharaoh, show me that you care about your people as much as I care about your people. And as much as I care about your people at the expense of my people. And Pharaoh's not capable of doing it. 
So Deb, Deb, this comes back to what you brought up about humility. And as what you see is, in other words, that that's where God's humility comes up. God is willing to, I don't, God doesn't have to prove a point. God doesn't have to show that, you know, I am all, God is willing to be magnanimous to God's enemies. Okay, but at least show that you're willing to do something. Show that you care. And that's the sad part. In other words, that God ends up caring more about, you know, Pharaoh's people than Pharaoh does. So I'm saying I could, we could probably come up with quite a few examples where we see that humility, but that certainly is a major theme that comes up throughout rabbinic literature. 